I guess we may as well jump into it, Paul. Uh, I'll give a little bit of background. You know, I think a lot of people have been hearing more and more about what's going to be happening uh, over the next 10 years and how we're going to be seeing a massive intergenerational transfer of wealth. And from everything I read, it sounds like it's supposed to be the largest one in history. Is that uh, correct? Yeah, it's correct. Yeah, based yeah, on well, the baby boomers, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, in terms of today dollars, that's about a trillion dollars they estimate over the next 10 years or so, which I, you know, I think what they've put the number to is about five, well, if you want to put it in terms that are a little easier to understand, for a trillion dollars, it's hard to understand. It's about $500 million a day. Um, I think it's also true right nowadays that a lot of people are far more aware of what is happening in terms of their investments but they're not necessarily up to speed on what is happening with their, with their estate and, and their and estate literacy. Um, so we've asked Paul to come and speak to our uh, clients on numerous occasions. He's dealt with a lot of our clients uh, along with uh, some of the people that Paul works with. Um, obviously we think it's essential for our clients to have a wealth plan in place. And that wealth plan can include anything from financial planning, business, business succession planning, of course, family wealth transfer. Um, but without having that in place, it's not very easy for us to properly manage to our clients' goals and objectives. So, which is why we've asked Paul to come in today. Um, I'm going to give a bit of background, Paul, and I'm not sure if you'll totally remember some of these numbers, but Paul and I started working together in 2002, I believe. At that's right. I think that's when you joined. That's right. Yeah. So Paul, Paul started as an estate planning uh, specialist, uh, started speaking to our clients way back then, and, uh, and now he runs our wealth and estate planning division uh, across Canada. So... It's great that we start with you. We actually still get to deal with you and not passed off. So <laughs> thanks for doing that for us, Paul. Um, he does everything from financial planning and, uh, you know, going to comp more complex tax and uh, estate and insurance planning strategies, uh, along with some of the people that he deals with um, and that we deal with at various uh, legal firms, et cetera, that we might have to pull in for anything. Um, today's Paul's main objective is to talk about multi-generational planning and making sure that all the pieces are in place for us when we are gone. Um, so I think with that, that probably gives you a bit of uh, open to start talking. I don't know if you want to add anything about yourself, but um, I'll let you take it from there. Great. Okay. Uh, so look, I'm just going to move right into it. I've got this presentation planned uh just an overview. I'm not an, uh, an accountant or a lawyer. Clearly, over you know 20 some odd years in this business, uh, you have to be um, very knowledgeable in estate planning, taxation, etc. We've seen thousands and thousands of clients and helped them out. So um, again, we always coordinate with what we're doing with either your professionals or we're happy to make referrals if the case uh, warrants it. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, share my screen here. And uh, there we go. All right. And then stop my video. Okay, so thanks. So multi-generational wealth transfer. Um, really what we're looking at is, is the best way, most efficient way to transfer assets to the next generation. And there's some things that the common questions that come up all the time that people aren't as familiar with as, as we would like them to be. Uh, I came across this Warren Buffett uh, quote, I think is incredibly relevant to what we're talking about today. It's, it's very important and, and very impactful what we do today on the future for our children or grandchildren. So before we do anything, of course, everything starts with a plan. I just wanted to review how we interact with people. So in our planning process, now there's a referral that's made, a uh, discovery meeting we would then hold with you. And this is where we would provide you with some documentation, perhaps ahead of time to help you prepare for the meeting. Or of course, our, we would go through, or, or, or Mark and Eric would go through a discovery document with you to gather that information. It's really important at that point to fully understand who you are, what your family dynamics might be, and of course, uh, 
if there are any, any other dependents that might be relying on you uh, for the future and or people who might be transferring you assets at some point. Then we move to the analysis stage, and this is where we might review your will. And, and the reason I mentioned this specifically at this point is in 2009, there was the Wills and Estate Planning Succession Act that came into play. Uh, it turns out that uh, there are many wills out there that have not been reviewed, and they may or may not be impacted by the changes that were made at that time. So this is where we would point things out to you or perhaps remind you to go and have that updated. The next part of it would be we create a plan and through there we know who we might have to coordinate with either external or internal partners for you uh, in order to have your plans implemented. So that could be accounting, legal, maybe a charitable foundations, um, or, or uh, could be many different things internally, insurance, investment banking, etc. We then move to the presentation meeting. This is where we will go through your financial plan with you and tell you all the results and what we were thinking. Um, I think the next part is actually the most important, which is the, the follow-up with you. You invest a lot of time in this planning process. I think where the true value will shine through is if you use it as a tool to gauge your progress moving forward. So uh, annual or biannual uh, updates are always welcome and very easy for us to provide those for you. So on to estate planning. Uh, look, there's some rationale for, for why you'd want to plan. Sets out your final wishes. You, you have the ability then to decide who will administer, administer your estate and of course, who the guardians for your children might be. There might be a rationale to establish some trusts. We certainly wanna ensure as much as possible that we can avoid some family disputes. Uh, Incapacity planning while you're able to do so. So that's for your financial matters or your personal health uh, care. Ensure effective tax and probate planning. Look, with everything that's going on in the economy right now, it's really important that, um, that we do proper tax planning moving forward. Uh, somebody's going to have to pay for all of these, these packages and the government at some point after we've gone through this is certainly going to raise taxes. Another really key thing that you want to avoid is the government deciding your affairs. And look, ultimately, death is inevitable, so we might as well plan for it. So some important elements that you have to consider when doing estate planning, we have to make sure our, our will is valid. And again, I reference the fact that there were some significant changes in 2009 that, that um, you know, if you haven't had a will updated since then, you should do so. Uh, power of attorney, that's for your legal and financial decisions. Representation agreements, those are for health and personal care matters. I just came across a will with a young family not too long ago. Uh, they had a power of attorney, didn't have the representation agreement. Um, in fact, could be the same person on that document that you've appointed, but you should have that document. Adequate insurance coverage, of course, if we want to eliminate the taxation. Uh, reviewing ownership structures for all of the assets. We want to ensure that there are beneficiary designations on our registered assets. Uh, there is some, might be a valid reason to implement the trust, which I'm going to go through in more detail pretty soon. And tax planning, again, I highlighted that. And the last one is charitable giving considerations. Perhaps uh, you'd like to leave some money behind uh, to a charity and we want to make sure that that's implemented. And if it's going to be implemented, let's do it in the most tax efficient way possible. So on with your wills. Uh, there's three good reasons. There's likely more than that. Uh, but I think the three key reasons, certainly you get to set out your final wishes. You are able to appoint again, as I mentioned earlier, your executor and you get to avoid the government defaults that I mentioned. If you don't have a will and you die, it's called dying intestate. And if you look at the key word there, dying test, uh, it's not for you, it's the family you leave behind that would have to deal with this will if it's not valid or there isn't one that exists. So it's important to get that done. So will planning uh, relates to the who, what, where, and how. Again, you get to select your executor. The executor is not a 
maybe some of you have been through this before. It's not a simple task to take on. It, there's a lot of work to do. So I've just listed some things here. Uh, funeral arrangements, notify beneficiaries, compile lists of assets, um, you know, review existing insurance policies. Uh, we want to protect the assets that are there. Uh, look, guys, I'm, I'm rolling this through here. I'm, I'm being a, a bit cute with it. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, that executor ha roles that an executor has to take on. It's not to be taken lightly in any way, shape, or form. And to make this easy for you, there is a way for you to, um, uh, there's a, a link from uh, Wiki Law. You can certainly click on that. And um, I think you'll find this is a very good way to kind of give you an overview. Uh, we will send this out at the end if you're interested in, in having that. So some will planning options when we're looking at that uh, is the use of multiple wills if we have a corporation as an example. So the primary will would take care of everything else other than the corporation and the secondary will would take care of your company. So the shares of your private company and in, but in doing so you get to avoid probate. There are some things you have to watch out for here but the reason that you can get away with this is that the uh, BC Land Titles uh, uh, Act will not allow you to transfer an asset without the will having been probated, but the BC Corporations Act will in fact uh, accept direction by the uh, executor. So that way it doesn't have to go through the court, no probate. The other thing you might wanna do is create a trust, and I'm going to go into more detail on that. So, we talked about how the will controls the who, what, where, and how. Trust now can help control the when. So when do we distribute these assets to the beneficiaries? And again, it's all based on your own specific fact pattern, but there may be rationale to delaying uh, the distribution of the assets. So some of the benefits for a trust is that we have a centralized asset management uh, for all of your, uh, the estate that you left behind. Certainly flexibility moving forward on how you want to distribute that assets, uh, again, depending on the beneficiaries and um, how they're, you want them to receive that. There is beneficiary uh, asset protection uh, from third-party claims, of course. Definitely increased confidentiality. And in some cases, I'll explain in a minute, you get to avoid probate uh, through the use of one special trust. Now, it may turn out that different family members uh, are better suited than others to receive uh, funds and some that are not. So there's something called a spendthrift trust, which essentially restricts ac access to trust principle. And where this might become particularly useful is if we have children that have addiction issues, um, maybe they have a lot of debt or prone to debt and or perhaps they're just really trusting and uh, are easily deceived. So in reality though, we might have a situation where we might have one individual receive the assets directly from the will, somebody who we might set up a spendthrift trust for and someone else who just set up a traditional family trust. So it, it's not a, a one size fits all, it, it certainly can be adjusted to your specific needs. So, when we, like a family trust or a testamentary trust is something that's created through the will and just the point, anything that's moved into a family trust has had to have had the tax paid on it. There's a different type of trust called an uh, uh, alter ego or joint spousal trust. It's a, a trust you set up while you're alive. And in this case, uh, you can actually move the assets into the trust without any kind of tax in, in implications. You have to be 65 years or older. There are certain assets you would for, for uh, you would and would not held inside there. For example, uh, registered assets don't go in there. Typically, we don't put the primary residence either. And when you pass away, you get to avoid probate because this trust converts automatically to a testamentary trust and would distribute to your beneficiaries. So there's no will in this case. And with no will, that means that there is no contesting. And uh, again, a key point may be the, the no um, 
the no probate fees as well. So a great tool to address planning needs and avoid potential conflict uh, in the courts later that may erode a substantial portion of your trust while they defend it. And of course, there's, there's no public disclosure of your individual estates and or your wishes. So people who don't need to be made aware are not aware. So the next one that is a very useful is disability trusts. And uh, if we just take a step back uh, in BC, people who are disabled can qualify for a provincial disability assistance program but there's some criteria to it. You have to have less than 100,000 in liquid assets. Yes, you can own a house and a car, but aside from that, the assets are restricted. So if I, if I was looking at funding uh, or giving money to uh, one of my children to look after them while I die, uh, once I've died, uh, I have to be careful how I give them those assets. So this is where we would use these disability trusts. And there's really two common situations for this. One would be a trust that we create while we're living, or maybe we establish a testamentary trust again through our will, as I discussed a little bit earlier. With a non-discretionary trust, uh, we can put $200,000 of capital into it, that's it. However, with a more common version of this, a discretionary trust, uh, and, and usually referred to as a Henson trust, the uh, individual only has a nominal interest in that the trust assets and income and capital is obviously at the discretion of a trustee. So this is a fully uh, discretionary trust. What's great about that is if you set up one of these Henson trusts, you uh, are not going to impact your child's, uh, your with the children with a disability, you're not going to impact their ability to claim on the government benefits. And in this case as well, there is no limit on the contributions that can go into one of those trusts. So a very, very uh, highly flexible tool that is used to address uh, children with disabilities. So some things you need to watch out for in, in some of the materials that I've just talked about, some planning considerations is with a multiple will, um, obviously sometimes it, things don't occur as they should. And, and people disagree, and sorry, I'm, I'm just, for those that see the visual, I'm, I'm just being a bit cute here, trying to put some uh, uh, a light spin on it. Uh, but sometimes people don't disagree, and uh, the will itself, these multiple wills may not be sufficient if, for example, there is a, a challenge to the will, then there may be cause that forces uh, a judge to probate the, the second will, so you'd lose that advantage. Um, you should have different executors. And one of the clauses you have to watch out for is something called a, a basket clause. In some cases, wills are written uh, as a bit of a catch-all to, to scoop up anything else that, that um, uh, you know, might want to be included. And in some cases, the wording of those wills can actually void one or the other of the wills. And another final issue with this is that you may end up um, uh, one Ontario court ruling uh, just recently had a, a will that was drafted to say that any assets uh, that required probate went into one will and any assets that didn't require assets went into another will. And the judge looked at it and said it's too vague and they basically applied probate to the entire estate. And so this is where we can have some additional tax implications to that. Now, uh, discretionary trust, so I put my assets in a trust and I'm hoping that my children will receive these and I might want to protect them from future marital breakdown. So there's a bit of question on this right now uh, on how this works. It's really recent in February, I believe there was a, a court ruling that came out um, where, you know, we looked at one point where 100% of the assets was, uh, was marital uh, property at one very short period of time. And then it became just the growth on the asset attributed to that one individual uh, spouse. Uh, but just recently, there was an interesting case where a chicken farmer uh, took his daughter um, off a, of a beneficiary of a trust, also removed her as a, as a trustee, and replaced the uh, mother as a beneficiary, and then he distributed the assets. Um, the husband's claim was denied in court. So... 
you know, again, you have to seek professional advice on these things, but some way to help avoid that is certainly having co-trustees and maybe some restrictions on distributions of capital. It's a really, really deep subject, guys. It could probably be an entire presentation all on its own. Um, joint assets, this is something we come across a lot, uh, where we get a phone call from somebody and they're simply asking to have their daughter or their, their son or, or both uh, placed on as uh, jo you know, a uh, joint owner of an account. Well, the reality here is that CRA may disagree with that. Uh, if they haven't contributed to the account, nor have they declared any taxation uh, during um, sort of the lifespan of the account on passing, CRA could assess that, um, uh, that it wasn't really a true joint account and then they'd be looking for some taxes on the gains as an example, and in some cases may apply some fines. The reality is I've not to date heard about this happening, not to say that it doesn't, but it's certainly there and something to be aware of. And I think more importantly for that would be a creditor exposure that you might have in dealing with this, uh, because now you, if, the, if your children are on as a um, joint owner of this account, then their creditors have a right to access it as well. The biggest thing I think where it's scary for me is when we do this on a principal residence where there could actually be loss of control. And again, this is a pretty extreme case where you might not be getting along with your uh, children. I, I don't see this too often, but I have in some cases seen this. I've seen this with um, a child that tried to steal dad's company when dad was on his deathbed. Uh, luckily, dad survived and was able to fight it off. Um, those are really rare, thankfully, but they can be out there. And I think, again, the credit exposure coupled with the loss of control, we should, we should be cognizant of these things. Hey, Paul, a quick question on that. Sure, please. When you do um, add your children or someone else to your account, uh, at mm -hmm. that point, there is a deemed disposition, is there not? Well... Theoretically, there if it depends on the, the yes, yes, and and so at that point, like if it's an all cash asset, as an example, like it's just it's all cash, then there's really no problem at all. They own fifty percent of it, or whatever the division might be. But if it's capital gains, there there's some uh, deferred capital gains in there, then that could be problematic because if it's a deemed disposition, you're going to have to pay some tax. And so if you track that down five, ten, fifteen years down the road. If it wasn't really a true asset, again, I haven't seen it, Mark, actually happen, uh, but it's, it's obviously there. It's, it's available, and I'm sure it has, or CRA could reassess that account, and, um, and there could be some taxes owing and potentially some additional um, fines, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, so, so I think that the biggest thing about estate planning, I think it's really, really important. It's the toughest conversation to have. We really should be communicating with our family what our intentions are. It's better to have those conversations now than, than later on. And I'll just give you a couple of examples that have come up for us uh, in the last couple of years where we had an individual who named uh, their best friend as guardians for their children but failed to let their, their sister or brother know about it. And this ended up in a really large dispute. Um, what would have been really helpful is to have that conversation ahead of, ahead of time, providing um, the rationale. It might not have stopped it, but it may have helped. And at the very least, maybe you might want to provide a, a letter to help uh, address that. Because you have to remember, you're not going to be around to, to smooth things over as you um, might be in, in a normal dispute situation. And, and add in maybe yeah. one other thing on that communication Please. side um, is, you know, obviously a lot of our clients have older children. Um, I think it's important to bring them into the equation very early to find out what it is that they want, um, whether there's a cabin that maybe isn't of interest to the kids or something like that. Um, and maybe yeah. it shouldn't be in the will. Maybe there should be some other discussion on what happens to it at that point. Those sorts of things are part of the, uh, the whole planning process. That's correct. And I, and I think the earlier we have those conversations, the earlier people can prepare for it. So for example, uh, I think you made a really important point. Maybe there's three children and uh, two of them could care less about the cabin on the lake and one really wants it. 
it, it might be great to find ways to equalize the estate transfer earlier on, maybe through the use of insurance or allow that individual to start to buy it up slowly over time uh, so that there are no hurt feelings. And especially um, if the plan is known, then you can imagine if, if they started to buy it and then it got distributed to that one individual and the other two would be very upset at that point uh, that they either didn't get a, a remuneration for it or equal value, or maybe they've changed their mind and decided they wanted the cabin, you know? So just one small point, but yeah, very good point, Mark. I think it's important to have these conversations for sure ahead of time. Um, so one of the things that, that uh, happens is people, people delay the, their estate planning, does delay their uh, uh, the creation of their will. And I get it. There's a lot of decisions you have to make. It, it's, it's not an easy process to go through, but it's really important that you do do it. Uh, you could end up with capacity issues. So by the time you decide you want to make a will, maybe you've lost capacity. Uh, certainly there's increased costs if you don't have a will for, in testacy that I mentioned. And, um, you know, the one thing that, that I think we're really, that, that paralyzes a lot of people is uh, they try to control too much from beyond the grave. Um, the reality is you can kind of only do your best and there's only so much you can reach out for. And look, ultimately, for the most part, trusts have a 21 year life on them anyway. Um, so at some point you just have to really let go, uh, do your best and, and kind of go on with it. Um, the other uh, big issue is people who try to do it all by themselves. So look, it's very easy these days to do that. Um, they're various different um, modes are acceptable. Uh, but look, I would seek professional assistance because the smallest thing can end up costing a whole lot of, um, of uh, money from the estate and maybe even more importantly, a whole lot of hurt feelings. So again, go through the process, lots of communication and uh, the small amount of money you'll spend to get a professional to do it with you will pay off in, in dividends for years to come for sure. So I just want to wrap up with something. We're talking about intergenerational wealth transfer and, and a pillar of estate planning is insurance. And I just wanted to go over with a very common strategy uh, that, that's being used to transfer assets um, from you know, grandparents all the way down to the uh, grandchildren. Before I do that, I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page. So we're all very familiar with life insurance. You pay your premiums. There's a death benefit that comes from it. And as long as the premium's been paid, there's a, there's a guaranteed death benefit. It's tax-free and it's probate-free. The type of policy we'd be using in this strategy, um, it has two components to it. It has the face amount that you're aware of, that you're familiar with, and then there's a cash component. And anything in there grows tax-free. So tax-free growth, potential for tax-free income depending on how it's owned and tax-free tax estate transfer and no probate fees paid as well. These strategies that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about can, can be held in a corporation or in individual. I'm just going to focus on the individual one today. It's, it's a lot easier to follow along with. The strategy is called an intergenerational wealth transfer and it's really quite simple. So we have a grandma, grandpa who set up this policy. They put some money into it and their intention is to ultimately have the grandchildren as the beneficiary for it. Um, this thing has a slightly different twist where now we add mom and dad on as co-insureds or and, and, and contingent owners. So it would likely not be all four of them, but it may be mom and dad, or grandma and grandpa, and maybe mom, or maybe it's grandpa and mom, et cetera. So there's some combination we would use there. And the reason we would do that is um, right now, grandma and grandpa control this asset, and with today's policies, they have within two, three years, 100% access to all of the cash they've put into it, and so they could quit this and walk away if their financial circumstances changed, uh, but ultimately then, when they do pass away, what happens is mom and dad, who were contingent owners and insured, now become the owners and the life insured for the policy, and again, it could be both, it could be one or the other. So now what we have is we have a policy that's remaining on the lives of mom and dad and the children are the beneficiary. During their lifetime, mom and dad can actually access this policy for tax-free income if they choose to. And ultimately, when they then pass away, the residual, and there always will be residual of these things are set up properly and it would be significant, would now be left to be transferred to the grandchildren. So what we've done is we've, 
created uh, an asset transfer from grandma, grandma and grandpa down to mom and dad. Mom and dad, if they chose to, use it to access tax-free cash flow in their lifetime. Again, completely optional. But then when they finally pass away, the grandchildren get it. So if you look at the lifespan that this would go on for, it's conceivably that this policy could be enforced for 20, 30, 40 years. And if it is, the amount of money and the death benefit and the cash flow in there would be quite substantial, even with a, a, a modest deposit in these type of plans. So I just thought I'd throw that in at the end. So at what works. age would you uh, look to set that up if you were the grandparents? And, and what is you know, too late? Uh, well, 85, would, 85, 86 would be too late, I think, at that point. Um, and then it's all relevant or relative, I should say, to the, uh, the size of the deposit, uh, what you're hoping to do with it, maybe the spread in ages between the um, grandparents and their children, and then ultimately the grandchildren. So, um, look, I would say to you that the reason I cap it out at 86 is because most life insurance companies, that's the cap on usually is 85 few companies go to 86, 87 on coverage. Um, so prior to that, it's worth kicking the can, if you will, having a look at it to see if it makes some sense if they're interested in doing these kind of things. But a highly impactful tool. Is it worth uh, looking at if you're single as well, or does it need to be a sort of a joint with right? No, well, you can do it single as well. Uh, look, there's multiple different twists on it. I just thought this was kind of an interesting one that's been used. Uh, you know, there, there's so many different twists and, and sort of adaptions of these, these plans that can be implemented. It is really quite interesting. Great. I'll let you continue. Yeah. Okay. And that, that's it for me. I, I apologize. There's a lot of information in a, in a very short period of time. Really just wanted to give an overview of some things you might be considering. And uh, you might want to you know, speak to, uh, you know, obviously you guys, Mark, or uh, certainly we're happy to meet as well. Yeah, I've got a couple of just quick follow-up questions. Can you give um, any sort of idea on, on total costs of putting in place a, a, a proper will, everything from obviously the basic and, you know, don't talk about Jimmy Pattison's or anything <laughs> sort of size-wise, but, you know, uh, and cost to that, but what would be a range of costs? Well, you know, the, the wills these days is, is relatively economical. For a straightforward, simple will, um, look, don't hold me exactly to it, but you're somewhere between $750, maybe a thousand sometimes. It's as low as that. And it just depends on how complicated you want to get beyond that. Uh, you know, the price is going to go up. But I will tell you that even with this, these alter ego trusts that I mentioned there, that used to cost thirty, forty thousand dollars to get one of those things set up, and now I think rightfully, again, don't hold me to it, but it's in around the ten to fifteen thousand dollar range. A very complicated estate can get set up with the inclusion of an alter ego trust as well. Okay. Um, how often should people be updating their wills? So they should be referring to the wills potentially updating no more than uh, five years. Okay. I would say just things change, life changes. Yeah. And uh, one final question for me sure. would be, I don't think um, we talked too much on the charitable giving side. We obviously have clients who don't have, uh, either they don't have much in the way of uh, family to pass along to, or they are, feel very strongly about certain places that they would like to pass it along to. Mm -hmm. Are there any key ways of setting up a will to deal with that? Well, you can set up the will and it would fund perhaps a, a charitable foundation. So with our firm, as you know, Mark, we, we have uh, access to what's called CIS, Charitable Impact Strategies. They're the, the engine behind our charitable giving program. And they allow, you know, so, so your will could create um, a donation to this foundation or you can set it up while you're alive either way, in which case uh, the uh, assets would continue to be managed by yourself and then distributed to a charities on an annual basis, depending on how either um, your clients would, would like that to be distributed while they're alive, and ultimately maybe how the family would want to distribute them moving forward. But it's a great way to you know, retain assets, but still control the, the outflow and the ability to change your mind on any beneficiary, or any, um, sorry, 
any charitable cause that you might be uh, interested in or, or one you might pick up later on. And it's really simple to use. Great. Yeah. I think that's all I've got tonight. I don't see any other questions that have uh, come up while we've been talking, but um, I, it gives us a lot to think about. And like I said uh, at the beginning of this, of this meeting, um, Paul's a, an amazing resource for us to have in-house and we encourage all of our clients to have a sit down and, and pro go through a proper wealth planning strategy and planning meeting. So feel free to give us a call and set these up. For the time being, they will be Zoom or conversations over a phone, but I think uh, according to Oregon, we're getting closer to starting to open things up now. Uh, and, and, and sorry, just one final note, uh, Mark. Um, they, they've actually accepted now virtual signing of wills and witnessing of wills. Okay. So uh, digital signing and virtual witnessing, I should say, of wills. So, um, yeah, look, clearly, well, hopefully, we're, we're moving to a, a more relaxed state. But uh, fully, failing that, nobody has to hold up the implementation of a will uh, based on um, social distancing rules right now. Great. Well, thanks very much. Okay. Paul. My pleasure. Stay healthy, everybody, and uh, look forward to talking to you all soon.